some of the problems we have in getting the mind into concentration come simply from an inability or unwillingness to let our thoughts subside. We find our thoughts interesting, we find our mental chatter interesting. We'd be hard put to know what it would be like to have a mind where this stuff wasn't going on all the time. So we're unwilling to let go. It's largely fascination with our thoughts. The other problems come from fear. When you sit down to meditate, you have to be with the body, you have to let go of your interest in the world around you. And just that much is enough to strike fear into some people. We all come to meditation with different issues about how we relate to our bodies. And some people find the idea of just being with the body and having unusual sensations come from the body kind of fun. Other people find it threatening. So it's good to know that if you have some fear around concentration or some aspect of concentration, to know that you're not the only one. And that people have been through this before, and there are other people who've had the same fears and they've learned how to overcome them. And that the dangers you're afraid of are things that can be dealt with. One of the first reasons for fear of concentration is that people have had traumatic experiences related to their bodies. Either they've been abused one way or another. Or they have a difficulty of being with the body because it brings, brings up memories of the abuse. These people, you find, have a tendency to go to space right away. And they seem to think that that's an advanced practice. They, don't, they can bypass the body, go straight to space. And the problem is they can't stay there very long. It's very tenuous. It's very unstable. And the real work is in the body, the way your awareness relates to the body. That's where the sankharas Bodily fabrication, mental fabrication, verbal fabrication, this is where they all come together. So in a case like that, you've got to say, well, there must be some spot in the body where you feel safe. Try to find that one spot. Take that as your beachhead and then expand your awareness as you feel comfortable. And any images that come up, any memories that come up, and just say, just let them go, let them go. They don't have to have a permanent impact on the mind. And bit by bit by bit, you can reclaim your body. For other people, getting into the body is not the problem. It's letting go of your sense of the world around you. There's some people who feel safe only if they know where everything is in the room around them, where everybody is in the room around them. And the idea of sitting here just being with your breath, your sense of the world around you, the room around you, just fading into the background. It's kind of threatening. This is why you want to meditate in a room where you feel safe. People like this also might want to meditate with their eyes open for a while. Do they get a sense of feeling solidly grounded inside, without so much need to relate to the world outside? Then there are cases when you're in the body and you start having weird sensations. Rapture can manifest, even sometimes pretty early in the practice, even before the mind has really gotten into any, any real jhana. There can be some ra <coughs> manifestations of rapture. That would be kind of scary. One in particular, there's a, there's a sense of fullness that comes. And I know personally of a couple of cases of people who had experiences of almost drowning in the past, and the sense of fullness that comes when the mind settles into the body, reminded them of those experiences, and it was scary. In a case like that, you have to remember that you're surrounded by air, you're surrounded by air, not by water. And the fullness is not a sign of drowning, it's a sign that you're settling in. If you find it too overwhelming, think of that soles of your feet, the palms of your hands, as energy escape valves. In other words, you can think of the energy, if it feels like it's an excess of fullness in the chest, say, or in the, the torso, 
that can flow at the arms, flow down the legs, and out through the palms of the hands, out through the soles of the feet. Otherwise you have a way of regulating things so you don't feel so overwhelmed. Other manifestations are the body feeling extremely small or extremely large, filling the whole room. And again, if you're the sort of person who wants to have everything under control, this is going to be threatening. Here you can say, well, I've got control over my breath. I'm going to stay with the breath. As for the undulations in your sense of the body, just let them be. They'll settle down. It's a phase that you can go through. Then there's a sense of space that comes. As the sense of the shape of the body begins to dissolve away. Again, some people find that threatening. They want to hold on to the, the body. I mean, you do want to be right here. You don't want to go off into some other thought world. But you can be here with a sense of being right here. And let the body dissolve away, dissolve away. You remind yourself, it's not going to die when that happens. It's right here. It's simply that the mental activity that identifies this part of the body is right here, and this connects to that, and the skin is right here, and the air against the skin is right here. Those activities are beginning to shut down. But it doesn't mean that they won't come back. They will come back when you want them. It's just that for the time being you don't need them. That's something you've got to remember again and again and again. You don't need those activities. You're trying to pare down the activities of the mind, and in so doing, the sense of the body is going to change for a while. Things will settle in and everything will be okay. Similarly, when thoughts begin to die away. As I said earlier on, there are some people who identify very strongly with their thoughts and they wonder what's going to happen to me if I'm not thinking. Well, just shift your sense of identity. Just be with the awareness. Be with the space. As long as you need to identify with something, identify with that. Regard it as a stepping stone, but it's a place where you can identify. Then, of course, there's the, the fear that comes when the breathing stops. Again, this can sometimes happen very early on in the practice, before we've gotten properly into the fourth jhana. If it happens, don't get scared. Just remind yourself, if the body needs to breathe, it'll breathe. You can't stop it from breathing, especially just focusing on the breath. As things get more and more calm, more and more still, you've got to spread your awareness to fill the whole body. Otherwise, you go into what they call delusion concentration, or just kind of zone out. And here it's helpful to have that perception in mind that there's breath energy filling the body. If the body needs anything in any part at all in terms of breath energy, it'll come. It doesn't have to come through the nose, it can come through the pores. Hold that perception in mind. Don't think of the skin as made out of latex or some other substance that is not porous. Your skin is very porous. In fact, the word porous comes from your pores. Energy can come in and out. What you need in terms of oxygen can, and can sometimes be supplied simply by the exchange that goes on at the skin, especially if the mind is very quiet. And if you find that really is settling down for longer periods of time when you're not breathing, just hold that perception in mind. You're not stifling the breath. If you are stifling the breath, the body will react. But if it's got to the point where it doesn't need to breathe, why force it? So these are some of the fears that people can have as they settle in, and some of the ways of dealing with those fears. But the important thing to remember is that you're doing something that's quite safe. I mean, there are a few dangerous things that you have to watch out for, but they may not be what you expect. One, if you get a vision, you don't want to go with the vision. 
and particularly you don't want to get into the vision. Because it might cause you to lose your sense of the body. And that's one of the ways in which people actually have out-of-body experiences. And for some people the idea of an out-of-body experience sounds pretty cool. But when you're not feel it <coughs> fully in your body, it's like not being in your house most of the year. Other things can move in. Then when the time comes for you to come back in, uh, they may not want you to come back in. They may lay claim to the place. So if a vision comes up, just breathe deeply into your heart a couple times, and the vision will go away. In other words, the visions are kind of like a dream state. And what you do is you reestablish mindfulness in the body, and that pulls you out of the dream state. If you find that you actually have left the body, try to think of the elements or the properties of earth, water, wind, and fire. Remind yourself, what does it feel like to be with the solidity of the body, the warmth of the body, the coolness and liquidity of the body, and then the energy of the breath in the body? Just call those things to mind, and you'll find yourself back inside. Because when you're outside of the body that way, you're not safe, the body's not safe. Again, to think of it as being outside of the house, you know, you're, you're lacking the shelter of the house, and you're not looking after the house. So both sides are in a position of weakness. But if you find yourself there, you're not stuck. You can just think of yourself in contact with those properties again. What does it feel like to be in a solid body? With the warmth and the liquid feelings, the breath energy. The more you've been working with the breath, the easier it'll be to do this. This is one of the reasons why breath meditation is the safest kind of meditation. You probably know the story of the monks who were doing body contemplation when the Buddha was away. They started heading off in the wrong direction. The Buddha came back, found out what had happened, and he called all the remaining monks, because some of them had gotten so depressed about the body they'd committed suicide or found assassins to do it for them. When the Buddha found out about this, he called all the remaining monks and said, look, when unskillful qualities come up in the course of any type of meditation, switch back to the breath, and the breath will clean things out. In the same way, the, the first rain of the, the rainy season will clean out all the dust that accumulated in the air in the, in the hot season, the dry season. It's one of the reasons why the breath is safe, because it gives rise to a sense of well-being. But secondly, it really gives you familiarity with what it's like to inhabit your body in a way that you feel comfortable with the body. You feel comfortable being in here. Most of us are like that character in James Joyce who lived at a short distance from his body. We're kind of with the body, but not really in it. Not really sensitive to it. The more sensitive you are to it, then strange things happen. You'll have a sense of what to do about it. This is a large part of our fear. We're not that familiar with being with the body in and of itself. We're either outside of the body or we have a, have, to have a sense of the body in a physical context. But you can work with the breath so you feel more and more secure being right here with the body, in the body, fully inhabiting the body. that you can finally settle down. Because you notice, as the Buddha goes through the descriptions of the four jhanas, you start out with the rapture and pleasure, and then the direct of thought and evaluation. Then the direct of thought and evaluation drop away. And I think at first, as I said, some people find that a little threatening, but you realize all you have to do is to be aware here. That's plenty enough to identify with. And the rapture seems too much, so you have to let that go. Then the pleasure seems to be too much of a burden. Then you finally get the mind to purity of mindfulness and equanimity. In other words, things settle back to a very normal state, simply that you're fully inhabiting the body and it's very, very still. And you want that to become your normalcy. 
Because it was at that spot that the Buddha gained all of his knowledge as it led to his awakening. So when you finally get the mind with the body and all the variations of things that happen in the body as you're trying to settle down with it, the, the fullness or the flows of energy, they finally settle down too. Then you're in the space where the Buddha was on the night of his awakening. You can ask yourself, okay, what, what did he see here that I'm not seeing now? But first settle in. Get so that you feel secure here that this is normal and the breath is at normalcy. The image that John Lee gives is as you're settling down, it's like going into a house of mirrors. Some of them are concave, some of them are convex. In other words, the rapture and whatnot can be distracting. But finally you get to a mirror that's just flat, but very clear, and you see yourself very clearly. But it does require that you give up your sense that you have to be pushing the breath in and out, and having the body firmly defined as what's inside, what's out. Those things you have to give up. But you find when you do it that you're actually in a much more secure place than you were before. So don't let the distortions and other things get in the way. You're heading to a state of really solid and normalcy. That's where all the best work can be done.